All right, and we are recording. Okay, uh, so one of the things that we're going to do with this session here is we're going to allow uh, participants to actually talk to us directly with questions. Uh, we're going to first start out with the questions that we received earlier and uh, try to answer some of those. And then I'm going to open it up uh, and allow those who want to ask a question. You, you, you would raise your hand uh, using the raise your hand icon at the lower end of the participants window. Uh, so you have to find your participants window and open that up. Uh, and then at the bottom is the raise hand icon, which is next to a feedback icon, which looks like a megaphone. You raise your hand, that means we'll unmute you and let you uh, ask your question. So for starters, let's go back to what kinds of questions were asked in the previous session. Uh, hey, Stephen, if I could interrupt you. You may. If um, participants can't find the raise your hand, just in the Q&A, put a note out there and I'll see it and ask, make a request to unmute you, you should be able to find that. That might be easier. Okay, like I'm raising my hand right now and that's what it'll look like when you find it. Okay, so let me get started. Uh, in our earlier Q&A, we did get um, a comment about uh, in-kind donations. And this comes from Janice, Shag, she's over at Faith Lutheran. Uh, she's one of our league coordinators. She says she was able to get donations of equipment from people uh, on Craigslist. Craigslist, for instance. Uh, Facebook Marketplace might be another place to go. Uh, just find people who are looking to sell, may be willing to donate what they're unable to sell. So I think that was a pretty good idea there, good suggestion. Another question that came out is that, is there any consideration to move the state tournament since the world's date has changed to July? In, in Georgia, we like to schedule our first tech challenge state uh, event to occur uh, on a different weekend from the first robotics competition of, uh, events. And we also have the venue secured and I don't know what's available. We haven't researched what's available for changing dates. Right now, we're just gonna stay the course and keep February in play. Uh, and FRC has, has uh, committed to making sure the FRC events end by the end of April. Now, I've just heard that there's a venue they wanna use in Perry that is only available the first weekend in July, so they may go with that. But we're also trying to avoid conflicting with testing, uh, ACT, other things that are going on at schools so that students can attend the competitions. And if we push the events out too much, they start to overlap and that becomes an issue, especially in May. So right now we're, we're gonna stay the course and play by ear, leave the state tournament where it is. It's gonna be smaller, so there's gonna be more of ability to distance ourselves, uh, as it would be said. Uh, but if we have to move it out, uh, we'll know better likely in December what we need to do uh, at the latest early January. And there was a comment about fully traditional uh, league. Now, to make a comment about the Etowah League, and I'm sharing all the different leagues on the screen right now that will be available to sign your teams up for, uh, the Etowah League has committed to being fully traditional, and that means having all the teams participate on location. Teams that can participate are ones that are able to travel to the locations and be a part of the traditional event. If they are at all needing a remote uh, type of event for any period of time, they really need to consider one of the other leagues. You have to be able to go to all of the meets and events at Etowah that you want to go to under the traditional format. Will you have social distancing and masks in place? Uh, I've also had uh, comments coming from emails about teams that need to be fully remote. And that's where GSMST comes in. They've committed to being fully remote on all of the events in the league. That's the meets and the league tournament. Both of those will have their own league tournaments and both of those will advance teams on a percentage base uh, uh, based on how big those leagues get to be. My concern about the fully traditional league is I only have 16 spots in that league. And if there are too many teams 
that want to go fully traditional for all their meets and all and the league tournament, uh, I'm going to have to turn them away from that. So it'd be nice to know in advance if you intend to be a fully traditional uh, team uh, and you want a fully traditional league. If that's the case, I may have to try to talk another league into going fully traditional. But for right now, uh, except for those two leagues, everyone else is starting out remote and transferring to traditional at a later date. And that may be the compromise that we have to go with. So uh, good to know in advance how many teams will need to do uh, fully traditional or want to do fully traditional and can commit to fully traditional. All right, so I want to open up the microphone now. Uh, and the first question we have is coming from Mr. Christopher Michaud. If you can open up his microphone and uh, let him ask a question. Hey, Chris, you there? Hello. Uh, yeah, my, my question was this. Um, I was reading through the game manual because we're, we're going to start remote, but try and move to traditional as soon as Maris will let us. Um, I've configured full sized fields. Do we, if we're doing remote, do we have to? Can we compete on the full size field, or do I have to reconfigure back to the um, the the smaller field as was shown in the game manual? So you don't have to do any reconfiguration at all. You can use the half field. Um, if you have a full field and you're using it, and say you're using both halves at the same time, uh, there could be some crossover, and that might make the actual idea of a remote event. Uh, not quite the same as someone who just has a half field. You can have interruptions on the, on the. Um, we would still run just one team at a time. Right. I would go back and forth on a field. Mm -hmm. You can go right. one half at a time, just not simultaneously. Right. Okay. And, and just remember that uh, for the remote versus traditional. Traditional, they show that the middle goal is for the opposing team. Mm -hmm. On the remote, that middle goal is for the team that's running. There is no crossover uh, goals. So okay. Low, middle, and high are all for the same team to score points for themselves when they're doing a solo uh, run. Oh, very good. Okay. So I want to make a differentiation about the different types of events that we can have. We would have the remote where teams would do their, their half-field run uh, on their field in their lab using a half field, which can be, you want to have the regular tiles, you can use the official borders, the IFI or the Antimark borders, or even your own homegrown borders. I strongly recommend using your border, especially for the wobble scoring at the end. You need to lift that wobble up over the wall. If you are missing any, <clears throat> excuse me. If you are missing any walls, at least have that one wall in the back that you can lift the wobble over. Also, you can use the cardboard cutouts that they showed, uh, that Aaron Fadden showed in the video. Uh, if you do your own homegrown scoring, just make sure the dimensions are right and that all is good. Uh, that's that's perfectly fine for remote. Now we are allowing uh, leagues to have what I call in person. It's not traditional, but it is setting up a field to allow teams to run the remote game on. So, say for instance, uh, making. First Presbyterian Day School. They offer a field at their school, but half their teams can, can't uh, attend because they're forced to be remote. Teams that want to go, they can at least go and see each other, but they'll run on the field uh, by themselves the same way they would run on a lab uh, field. The referees and the inspectors would be the people on the team, the coaches and whatnot. There are no official referees or whatnot for that. And then the third way to put this together is the full traditional that we're all used to, the two versus two with, with uh, referees and scorekeepers and inspectors. Uh, and that's where all the rules are followed. Christopher's got a couple more um, comments or questions about the field. Stephen, Christopher, you are still unmuted. Yeah, he's muted now. There he goes. Oh, I just, oh, so two questions. The large leagues last year received funds to purchase two fields. Is that going to be the same this year for Marist and North Georgia? Will so larger leagues. So this year for the field elements, mm -hmm. we purchased and have and are having them drop ship directly to you. You should be receiving two fields and they'll ship out on Monday. Great. Your large league. Good. And also saying Marist will also, as soon as I get approval, we're going to 
open up during the week to have the other teams from the league be able to come and do their runs at the school, as you, okay. as you described. So thank you. Right. Yeah, the, the policies you need to follow for social distancing are related to what your school allows uh, for those types of things. And uh, the same thing with remote event. If you are doing your own remote uh, solo scoring, you follow the policies of the building that you're in. Okay, Stephen, Terry's got a comment. Terry, are you go okay if I unmute you and you share the information about the Etowa? I'm gonna unmute you. Sure, no problem. So I just want to clarify that the Etowah meets are scheduled for um, Dallas, Georgia, and Cartersville, Georgia. The team that hosts that um, league is out of Canton. So uh, for anyone that's considering that as an alternative, um, if they are interested in traditional meets, um, they need to be aware that the meets are scheduled for Dallas and Cartersville. So that could be an hour drive from Canton. Yeah, that could be a hard to drive. When, uh, when we have the registration system up for coaches to look, all of the events will be listed in the registration system, and we're going to be asking coaches to select the meets that they plan to go to on that system. Uh, and then the details about each of those events will be available to the location, so you can make a decision about how far you want to travel. We're still working out the registration system and uh, it's still under development at this time. So we had to delay the registration process, but we should have it up by the 28th. All right, so do we have any other questions out there? You, you got a question from Malak? Ah, all right. Malak, let's hear you. Let's see what you got. Hey, first of all, great work as always. Thank you for doing this. I just want to know if there is there any more information we can get on safety measures in traditional meets. So I'm, I'm really looking at sort of involving the parents. Some may not be comfortable with it, some might be. Mm -hmm. If I had any more information, I could communicate that better and make this easy. All right. So for traditional meets, we're still working out the details from a Georgia first standpoint. But the things I can tell you are masks will be required and social distancing will be required. In addition, we'll want to minimize the number of people going to the event, such as just the drive team and the coach, two mentors, basically, uh, two deep leadership. Uh, which would basically be um, five people, if at all possible, going to a meet. Stephen, are you um, not allowing um, spectators? Spectators are not allowed. No, we need to keep the head count down. Yeah. So you know, any so if yeah, I can I can uh, take notes. But if there was some sort of a handout I could give to people, that'd be great. Yeah, if you have parents that want to be along for any reason for you know their concerns, you could make them one of the mentors that go, or you could bring in a third person. Just remember that we're following social distancing rules. Uh, it gets a little interesting around the drive box with a two on two because the, the drive team is right there. Uh, so I'm not sure how that's gonna work out necessarily, uh, but we're we're still looking at that to see what we can or can't allow for that space. It's pretty short time that you're in there, and there's only four teams that are up there. And if we're all wearing masks and whatnot, uh, I don't think there'd be too big of an issue. Usually, the masks are definitely necessary if you're getting less than six feet. Thanks. So, if there's any topics that you would like for Stephen to expound on. Um, please put them in the Q&A if you don't have a specific question. Well, do you have another question? I see a hand up. I have unmuted him. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, I had uh, perhaps uh, questions that belong in the in a different meet. It's um, about scoring, etc. I think mm -hmm. those have become clear as as time goes on. Anyway. Yeah, there's a lot of things about the scoring that I'm not familiar with. Uh, but Lori O'Neill, our state referee, uh, has combed over the uh, the game manuals uh, in preparation for a Q&A, which is going on concurrently with this one uh, in the other room, uh, in other uh, class number five, I believe. Yeah, I just and, want, I didn't want to ditch you and go there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I understand. Uh, if you need to jump between, that's no big deal for me. No, that's fine. Uh, we, we've got kids there, so they should be good. Okay, good, good. All right, I'm gonna mute a lock and it looks like Betsy's got a question for you. Betsy, okay. I'm going to unmute you. Great. Um, hey guys, uh, this may have already been answered. Sorry, I joined late, but um, there's, I noticed six matches um, in an event versus five ma matches last year. Um, could you guys just uh, maybe talk about the thinking behind that or just like what's the reasoning there? Sure, uh, in all previous seasons, uh, events were allowed to choose five or six matches per event. It was a choice. It was flexibility. A lot of it depends on trying to minimize the number of surrogate matches that would be run, uh, where a team would be running a match but not get a score or credit for it. Uh, so, so the math division usually helps if you had five or six involved. With the re and, and that may still play in on traditional events, since the traditional event scores will be all for a uh, that meet, there won't be a mix of traditional and remote because that's an apples and oranges comparison on scoring. So with uh, traditional, they may be still five or six, but with remote, uh, we allow teams to do uh, six matches per uh, during the meets. Uh, and same thing will happen with a remote uh, league tournament, for instance. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So, yes, uh, Christopher, you're asking the question uh, that the top 10 scores still count like last year. Uh, so last year it was you would do your meets, you would do as many matches as you could. And the rule said that the top 10 win loss uh, rankings would move forward into the league tournament. The same applies this year. The rankings are determined slightly different. Uh, last year it was win loss followed by um, uh, what was the second one? Your your, your uh, tiebreaker points, which was a sum of scoring, followed by high score. This year it's the the ranking points are the sum of your scores for a match followed by what happens in your, I think it was autonomous, uh, to tie break any ties in the total score, followed by the third level, which was the um, end game task, tie breaking that. And if all of that being equal, the teams are so uh, exactly the same, it'll be a random choice uh, to rank them beyond that. So that's the luck of the draw. Never had to get that far before. Uh, Actually, the only time you see a random draw is at the very beginning of a match when everybody has zero points, zero score everywhere. So everybody's tied and it's randomized ranking. I'm going to unmute Christopher. He may want to add something about that scoring. Oh, no, I, I think I, I think I remember hearing this before. It was match auto end game for the tiebreakers, which you just said. Um, yes. And when the student, the when the teams are keying in their scores in the FTC web-based system, then that will automatically do all the calculations within the league, correct? Mm -hmm. Like last year, we had to man you know, we had to manage this database and the uh, FTC school app. But now that'll be actually more on the teams and more centralized, correct? Yeah, the, the uh, scoring database will still be used for traditional events. So right. it'll be the same as previous years, how that works. Uh, the, and when, a, when we put a, an event into the first system, we have to declare if it's a traditional event or a remote event. Uh, traditional events will require the scoring system that we were used to, and the remote events will then allow teams to go through the dashboard to submit scores into the web interface that becomes available. 
I, I end up or the league coordinators that have to do the invitations to the teams that are participating in a particular meet. There'll be a lot more information on the instructions and how to use that uh, forthcoming. Okay. They're still, they're still in uh, alpha or beta testing. When we, when we transition from remote to traditional, how will the scores translate over? Let's say we do three remote leagues and then we're able to transition to two, the last two traditional and then the tournament. Will there be some type of algorithm or like, or will that be, where, where will that be computed? So I'm not exactly sure how they transition over quite yet. So say the first three meets are, are remote and then the fourth and fifth meets are traditional. There's not an apples to apples com comparison mm -hmm. there uh, because with the remote, it's only your score. And with an alliance, it could almost be a double score. Mm -hmm. So there's some details I think that need to be those are good questions to be asked right now, how that would play into the top 10. Right, okay. So Stephen, I got a question for you. You've got these leagues that are up here and yes. this is assuming a certain number of teams. And if we get a whole bunch more, we're gonna add more leagues. I, we won't need to add more leagues. The number of spots available across all these leagues far exceeds the number that I expect would be registered at this point. In fact, uh, this number of leagues supported all of the teams that we had last season. So I expect these leagues uh, to be more concerned about meeting the minimum number than uh, exceeding the maximum number. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the ones that have a minimum, minimum number of 12 those are the leagues we're expecting to have a league tournament all by themselves, and that requires 12 teams. So their minimum is 12. The other leagues uh, in the middle there, uh, we're expecting to combine those for their league tournament. So the minimum per league is eight right now, uh, which is uh, the first minimum. Okay. Betsy's got a good question here about um, what coaches may need to do. I'm going to unmute you, Betsy. Awesome, thanks. Um, yeah, so I heard, uh, Steve, I think you, you recommended um, for a team that's participating remotely that it would be a good idea for them to, uh, for like the coach to um, participate in a referee and inspection training. And I was just wondering if you could expound on like what, what that training is, when it might happen, you know, what it looks like. I don't know, just talk more about that. Right, and so the recommendation actually comes down from our inspector, our state inspector, Eric Richardson, and our head referee, Lori O'Neill. Uh, they're recommending that uh, the coach or somebody on the team, uh, one of the mentors, one of the adults, go okay. through the official referee and inspection training courses. Uh, usually those courses are made available when someone volunteers for an event. If you volunteer, hey, I'll be a referee. They'll send you a link or through the dashboard say, you have training that you need to do. I think we need to, on our end, uh, figure out the logistics of triggering that training for a coach. Uh, maybe we open up uh, a training event and let everybody sign up as referees and then they get the, uh, the training. But it is highly recommended to go through that training to understand what it is to look for uh, when scoring your own teams in a remote setting. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I look forward to you uh, doing that. <laughs> okay. All righty, and Terry's got a question for us. So Terry, I'm going to unmute you. So will the teams advancing to state be based on the number of teams in the league tournament? The number of teams that will advance will be based on the number of teams signed up for a league. So, for example, if North Georgia has 30 teams signed up and 20 of them participate in a league tournament, the percentage will be, will be based on the 30 teams that signed up. Uh, we can't control if a team shows up or not, uh, and we're not going to adjust the numbers based on the number of teams that participate. Uh, because uh, it, I don't think it would necessarily be fair to the 20 because they can't control the other 10 not showing up. So the two two league tournaments that are fully remote and fully re traditional may only have like 12 teams. So 
you're probably only going to have a couple teams advance to state as opposed to the Alliance Academy where they could have 32 teams. They're going to see more teams advancing the state because of their numbers. Yes, that is that would be the case. Yeah, the smaller the event, the uh, smaller the advancing number of teams. All right, Terry, I'm going to remute you. Let us know if you've got more questions. So do we have any uh, uh, new coaches this year that have not done First Tech Challenge before? <laughs> we are all now new with the remote yeah. format. Yeah, it, it is. It is definitely a uh, an interesting uh, point of view. There's a lot of questions about honesty with the scoring on a remote uh, format, and you know, part of this is let's keep the program alive and let's let the kids learn from what's going on. And the more they follow the rules, the more legitimate their scores would be, and the more legitimate they'll feel about what they've accomplished so if we have a team that's all about the trophy and wants to put in nefarious scoring uh, because they really want that trophy just just let me know and we'll put them in contact with the trophy vendor and just you know send them a trophy that way that's not what this is about it's not about getting the trophy so much as it is learning from the robotics experience and what what teams can get out of that And I'm going to unmute Christopher. Oh, no, I was just saying that uh, Paul, I've also been sitting in on the FRC sessions, and both programs are just very, very different than what the students have expected in the past, especially this large group um, celebration and collaboration um, because of the limits of students. So it really is going to be kind of setting this up and managing their expectations and uh, working it more as a uh, an entity. More of an individual team experience of you versus the field and what, you know, uh, you get you. That's what you get out of it as opposed to winning or being selected or advancing on the world, which simply may not happen. Yeah, and I agree with that. There's a lot of uh, us against the field. Uh, uh, with this new season, and uh, I think, you know, I'm excited that there's a launching aspect to this and, uh, you know, someone had said they can't wait to, until the first time somebody. Uh, gets hit in the head with a with a ring. But the good thing is, is their foam and they'll just bounce off. Uh, wear your safety glasses. That's my best suggestion. But uh, you're right. It, it is very different. Uh, we're adjusting. FRC is especially adjusting because of uh, they really can't do remote uh, activities. So they're trying to find solutions around the traditional sense to allow uh, teams to compete while and, and get the best benefit out of the events uh, since they can't, uh, they don't normally have a field in there. I know I'm going to wind yeah. up steering a lot of my FRC kids back to FTC because mm -hmm. if you can only bring six kids to an FRC competition and you have a team of 20 or 25, that's just a lot of kids that we're not going to get to do, you know, not to get to be part of the main experience. Yes. So uh, this week is come to FTC. <laughs> Yeah, well, one thing to keep in mind is both at FRC and FTC, judging can be done virtually, even in, tradi in a traditional sense. That's an easy one to do through a camera. Uh, we can adjust for that. And that's where you get the other students involved who aren't directly related, uh, directly focusing on the robot itself, uh, whether it's the marketing groups or whatnot. Uh, and that happens to both FTC and FRC. I, I, I tend to like to think FTC is a small business where an FRC is a, is a corporation as far as scale goes when it comes to students. So those who are involved with both uh, can get the aspects of both uh, FTC being wearing many hats and FRC being part of a department.
So Stephen, is there, when we look at these types up here and we're specifically looking at the remote to traditional, is there a defined trigger or is that a, we're just kind of saying just it depends on what's going to happen with all this COVID stuff? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, right now, the the thought is that for these leagues, October and November events will be remote. Uh, some of the some of the leagues may offer a field that teams can go to and do something in person, but still score as a remote activity. And anything in December and January, the idea is that they will go traditional. Some with meet four, some with uh, meet five. Uh, I think the balance. All of them want to have a traditional league tournament. Uh, the only one that won't have a traditional league tournament right now would be Lawrenceville GSMST. So that's the current plan uh, looking forward. If the infection rate skyrockets, that will be pulled back to mostly remote. And if it goes down and we start to open up and feel better about uh, seeing each other again, then maybe they pull back into November. But we're kind of playing it by ear uh, as far as when we transition. For right now, the plan is October, November for remote, December, January for traditional. Uh, and it's really dependent on their school policies. Okay, that that helps. Um, another question, and I'm asking questions because you guys aren't, and I'm not an FTC person, so I'm pretending to be an FTC new wannabe. That works. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can also think of all sorts of questions. So, do do most schools not have their own field? Do, do you know? Because I, 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 you know, we've got what a hundred and a little over a hundred teams. What percentage of those would you say had a field that they would be able to practice on? And where I'm going with this is how, as a new team. Will I know who the veterans are and and who has got a field that they're saying, "Hey, if you want to come over and, and practice, um, we can make that happen." How how do I know about all of that stuff? Right. Okay. So that's part of it is who's going to have a half field, and in First Tech Challenge, the cost of having a half field can actually be pretty low. Teams can build their own. <clears throat> I think the biggest cost if they build their own is really about the soft tiles that are inside those. That's the only thing you can't build your own on and you can't, you shouldn't go to a se separate different type of vendor. You need the three, three eighths inch thick, three eighths, not the three eighths inch. Uh, what is it? Uh, five eighths inch thick tiles. Uh, they're gray tiles because you don't want to change the, the floor format. Uh, but otherwise you can keep your costs down on, on building a half field. You also can purchase uh, the game elements separately from the game parts. Uh, there's the uh, the ring is the game element. You have to purchase the game element. Uh, the cost isn't super high for those. The cost of buying the entire half field, I think it's around $260. So we've helped by offsetting that cost by reducing our league tournament fee by $50. It was $300 last year. It's $250 this year to try to help teams more teams purchase that. Uh, but it's recommended that every team have a half field that they can work on in their labs. First Tech Challenge uh, actually caters to that a lot better. Um, most teams can't build a full FRC field, so they have to build parts. Uh, even even the practice field at an FRC event is is small and has parts that they can scale against. So. Beyond that, how do teams know that they have other teams they can go with? All teams will sign up for a league, and that league coordinator is the best point of communication between all the teams in that league. Uh, they also would know who is willing to provide a field for other teams to go work with, uh, whether it be themselves or another team in the area. Or even a DE site. There are DE sites out there that have had uh, First Tech Challenge fields at. I haven't had any requests this year for elements at First Tech Challenge DE sites, 
but uh, that doesn't mean that they won't happen. Okay, thank you. Looks like we've got another comment that's coming in from uh, Gina Dunlap. Yes. Gina, I'm going to unmute you. Hi, sorry, my voice is gone right now. Um, we actually have a field with uh, Milton High School um, right now. Obviously, due to COVID, there's so many restrictions and stuff like that right now. Um, yeah. But we do usually really enjoy um, having uh, skirmishes and just kind of um, I guess um, Saturdays that we'll get together with one or a couple other teams and just go, okay, how can we help each other to do a better job or how can we improve it with each other and kind of look at, you know, if we can, if we can work together, we see where our weaknesses and our strengths are. And we realize that that has helped um, tremendously as well. Right. So some of the answers to that, <clears throat> especially with the restrictions is, you're going to be limited to working on your field um, by yourselves at this point with your elements and your uh, uh, game setup. Uh, the suggestion, though, for the outreach is to have teams share videos of what they're doing on their own YouTube channel, for instance, and then telling other teams in their in their leagues or in their regions, "Hey, I put this video up, and uh, this is what we're trying to do here," uh, and then collaborating through that uh, through that method. All right, do we have other questions that are out there? How do the meets work if the robots don't interact together? So uh, I can ask, answer that question, Gina. Oh, <clears throat> I need to get a drink of water first here, hang on. I've been talking all day. All right, the, uh, the, tra tradi the traditional meets, of course, are two robots and an alliance against another alliance of two robots. And if you saw in the game animation video today, um, there's the low goal, the medium goal, and the high goal. Of course, and the medium goal is swapped between the halves. So the low goal is for the red, the medium goal is for the blue, and the high goal is for the red, and then the reverse on the other side. And that adds an element to the game where two on two, you can get some good scores and a lot of action in there. For a single solo, uh, uh, run, what you would do is remote. You would have only your robot on the field doing what you can with 10 rings. And that middle goal is no longer swapped. It's all three, the low, medium, and high, uh, that solo robot will score for. There's also a couple penalties that can't occur. And the, de the actual details between the traditional and the remote scoring are outlined in the game manuals. There's a traditional game manual set and a remote game manual set that you can look at. Um, and and uh, find the differences there. So what you'll see during a remote event is likely scores that are, I would say, half as high as you would see with an alliance meet. And uh, if they don't interact with each other, that means you don't have anybody blocking, uh, which may actually help increase the score a little bit. So uh, a lot of the, what's different is gonna be speculation. Uh, until we actually start to see the robots performing. And then the game uh, co game committee will see comments come back and possibly make adjustments t as necessary to, to the game uh, if there are big issues. Okay, I'm going to unmute Alok and let him ask that question specifically. Sure. There you go. Thank you. This is in reference to the lady who was talking about um, offering uh, and meeting other teams. To yeah, Gina, yes. Gina, yes. Um, um, so, but we're still we're still allowed to offer whatever we can, not beyond the YouTube channel. Our teams are still allowed to offer other teams, for example, to use their field. Obviously, social distancing has to be followed and all that, but there's no restriction on on still trying to uh, collaborate with other teams, 
beyond the YouTube channel. I just want to make sure of that. Right, right. Uh, as far as uh, social distancing, mask wearing, and rules like safety glasses and whatnot, uh, we we do want everyone to wear the safety glasses when they're working with equipment. But those rules from first and the Georgia first uh, rules or guidelines for uh, masks and social distancing are applicable to official first events. If you as a school want to offer your field up for others to come to, you just need to follow your school's rules as far as what's necessary. Uh, and then whoever you invite will follow whatever rules they're comfortable with. Okay, perfect. Uh, and, and Gina, if you want to go to the resources page for uh, First Tech Challenge, uh, firstinspires.org, they have both sets of gaming elements. And I'm going to do a little search here to see. Uh, first okay, Stephen, we are seeing your planned leagues um, PowerPoint. So at this you... point, yes. Okay. Uh, so now we have the the resources here, and I'm in annotation mode, so I need to turn that off somehow. Huh. Uh, turn that off. Okay. So ultimate goal presented by Qualcomm Game and Season, and there they are. Uh, part one for traditional and remote. And then part two for traditional and remote. And if you're playing remote, you'll want to use the rules in part one and part two that remark remote. And if you do get to a traditional event, definitely go you use the part one, part two for traditionals. Kristen has a really good question. Sure. I'm going to unmute you, Kristen. Kristen. Hi, I'm wondering if face shields can take the place of safety glasses. Like, I, th I think that we're going to want our team to wear masks and shields when they're not social distancing, and then adding safety glasses to that seems a little like maybe that won't work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. And the, the yeah. whole thing about safety glasses, they're the ANSI approved with side shields on them. They're not yeah. letting anything get in near the eyeball. If those face masks um, can manage to meet the ANSI rules, there's nothing saying you couldn't use them. A lot of face masks, though, are pretty open around the backside there, and that may not prevent things from flying uh, in there. And as a matter of fact, the face mask, if something's flying in from behind, gets in that slot, bounces off the front and into an eye, I'd be very concerned about that. I think ours well, are like, probably compliant, but maybe I will, like, show you the submit the design to somebody mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah we're, we're definitely worried about things flying in people's eyes and if it becomes a ricochet chamber in there uh, i would be concerned if it can keep things out from the side i think it'd be all right okay great Sitting here by my window, I have seen more clouds today than I have in the past week and a half. Definitely a good amount of rain today, I think. My grass needs it. Ah, so everyone has heard my cat, everyone has heard my dogs. Uh, what else we got? Uh, washing machine, maybe? <laughs> Any other questions out there? Gina is asking about the prior page that you had on dates. I think she wants to do a screenshot of that. Sure, there you go. Oh, as far as dates go? Or just the leagues? Oh, huh? I think I know what you're talking what? about. Uh, let me see if I can find a slide on, you want dates of events? I unmuted you, Gina. Um, actually, both of I'm trying to get a screenshot of both the planned leagues and of the and of the other. I got in late because I was having some computer issues. That's all. Sure. Do you got a you screenshot know, of this one? Uh, just one a second. I'll too. have it. I had to move some people out of the way. <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> Benjamin. So it's my understanding that all of these recordings are going to be put onto the YouTube so that you can yeah. get to them. And exactly. some of them are there too. 
Yeah, and then Stephen, you have the option of giving your slides to Chen to post on the Georgia first site. So if people wanted to get to the slides that you shared in your first session. Yes, please. And just realize that what I'm showing here definitely can change between now and September 28th. Right. When we officially release it on the registration system. Okay. All right, so I've got the dates. I'm going to, I'm going to switch to that slide here. And give you the dates. Yeah, I understand it's all preliminary. So, yep. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much. Well, we have about what uh, 10 minutes left. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, Gina, you're uh, you're welcome. I'm proud uh, and happy that uh, to give you a presentation that is full of information that uh, you can use. I know that there are some things up in the air. It's a lot better than it was a couple weeks ago. Uh, I'll say that much. And uh, we'll get through this season, and I believe everybody will get uh, get what they can out of it. I'm excited to see what happens. And, and I noticed that the I really should fix this slide. I've got the wrong year on it. <laughs> yeah, go back to here. 2020, 21. That's just, that's really hard to say. 2020, 21. Yeah. All right, I think that's fixed now. Save that for later. All right, so if you could into the Q&A, can you type the team numbers that you're representing? Uh, Christopher, I'm not worried about you. I know that you have uh, a bunch. <laughs> you have 16 teams that are gonna register all together, Christopher? Oh boy, <laughs> a league of his own. Well, you have a very good program at your place, you having 110 students. So Jan, is this a Q&A savable somewhere? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> but I can come in here and let me see if I can, um, I think I can do a copy and paste. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Now, Shelly is asking, when is the league registration? So first registration with Manchester, where you actually officially create a team, that's wide open now for everybody to do. Uh, for the league registration, we're currently working on a new registration system that's a lot more dynamic than what we've had in the past. And that will be available on September 28th.
when when the time comes, we'll be sending out details in the newsletter. It's coming up. And uh, so keep an eye out for the newsletter. Make sure you can get those newsletters from uh, Mr. Quarles. I'm going to check to see where he's pulling those from here a second. See if I can find uh, the email address that he uses. Yeah, I'm not finding it. I'm not sure where I put my newsletters. Uh, I will make sure to, uh, I'm gonna find out what that is. I wanna say it's coming from me, uh, S-H-O-V-E-Y at gafirst.org. Yes, thank you, Terry. They are coming from my email. So make sure to green light, whitelist, uh, my email, S-H-O-V-E-Y at gafirst.org. And that should get through any school firewalls, I hope. Otherwise, use a, a non-school email uh, in your first registration. Okay, unless there's any other questions, I think we're going to wrap this up. I want to thank everybody for joining us, uh, asking the questions, and good luck with your teams this season. Uh, look forward to seeing you either remotely or hopefully traditionally, and we'll go forth from there. Play it by ear, hope for the best, and help our kids learn. Thank you, Stephen. I'm stopping the recording.